morning and welcome to Global Perspectives. From our home studios, I'm David Dumkey. And I'm Katie Coronado. Welcome. Today we're honored with the presence of the founder of CUNY Haitian Studies Institute and Brooklyn College sociology professor Jean Eddy St. Paul. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much, David and Cathy. Uh, thanks for the invite. So, Professor, uh, there's a lot of questions we want to ask you. Obviously, Haiti's been very much in the news of late since the July 7th assassination of the president. What does this mean as an event for Haiti today, and what, is it, what does it suggest for the future? So, unfortunately, David, uh, Haiti, unfortunately, uh, the uh, global narrative on Haiti uh, have been focused uh, more uh, when uh, the country has been in struggle, in problems, not really when the country has been in order like stability. So unfortunately, that has been always the tendency of the global narrative on Haiti. And unfortunately, the assassination of former President Jovenel Moïse once again uh, put Haiti in the spotlight. Can you tell us a little bit more about what we know about the uh, assassination of President Moïse? So uh, usually what we know so far about the assassination, the, the, that, that tragic event that I lamented, that tragic event that I lamented happened in the morning of July 7, 2021, and it uh, responded to what I would call a trans transnational crime because there were like uh, a former uh, Colombian uh, um, uh, um, police, Colombian soldier involved, member or former member of people who were like um, trained by the DEA uh, in the US and also the involvement of uh, Haitian for sure. So it's like a transnational crime that happened and that took the life of the president. Another fact also that is important for uh, our listener, uh, our viewer, is that the president was not just assassinated, but it was an assassination that was accompanied by what I would call a hate, a crime. Because like they, you know, they did a lot of things with his body. So it's like, there is an assassination that revealed that some social group, they had some very uh, tough issue with the president. So, and they used that uh, way to solve the problem. And that was very unfortunate. President Moise had uh, many domestic opponents, and obviously there's foreign uh, intrigue, certainly in, in the assassination plot. Can you give us a little context about what Haiti was going through before the assa assassination in terms of the economy, in terms of what COVID had done uh, to Haiti? And obviously, Haiti's been, unfortunately, the victim of several natural disasters in the past decade or so. So, uh, David, uh, uh, Jovenel Moïse, uh, before he became the president of Haiti, um, he was unknown. He was not someone with his, uh, that the population knew who was Jovenel Moïse. He was unknown for, unknown for the general public. The Jovenel Moïse was introduced to the Haitian people by the former president Michel Joseph Martelly, a.k.a. Sweet Nicky, a musician, you know, a musician, that also Michel Martelly, who won Haiti between 2011 and 2016, and Michel Martelly actually got into power with the help of the United States of America, and more specifically with the help of the U.S. Department of State at the hand of Hillary Rodham Clinton. So that can give you a certain context. So the guy who introduced Jovenel Moïse to the Haitian electorate was Michel Martelly. And we, Michel Martelly, became president with the strong support of US of foreign powers. So just I, that idea of foreign power is very important because for our listeners, they have to be mindful. They have to know that Haiti uh, is the first 
country in the Western Hemisphere to actually achieve the unique, unique anti-slavery revolution. And the moment that Haiti achieved that revolution, Haiti was uh, portrayed as a threat for the international community because it was the institutionalization of industrial capitalism and capitalism couldn't operate without slavery and without colonialism and without racism. And the Haitian revolution that happened on January 1st, 1804, challenged ontologically, you know, the ra racism that accompany capitalism. So one of the first uh, bad things that happened in terms of context for our listener, it was in 1825, Haitian people, they had to pay to friends um, uh, one, uh, 21 billion dollars just for friends to recognize the independence of Haiti when the independence was not given to Haitian. Haitian took their independence after a bloody, bloody battle. You know, that was in terms of in morality, international morality, that was immoral to do that to a country. But the U.S., France, Spain, all those countries, they sidelined with France to ask Haiti to pay for uh, the fact that the country took its independence. But let's move on in the uh, uh, 20th century. It was in the context of the Monroe Doctrine that was uh, framed by um, the President Monroe, uh, uh, America for, um, for Americans, uh, uh, the Monroe Doctrine is important for imperialism. So the U.S. intervened military in Haiti after the assassination of another Haitian president. His name was Vilbrin Guillaume Sam. Vilbrin Guillaume Sam was assassinated on July 28, 1915. And the same afternoon, the same afternoon of July 28, 1915, the U.S. under the presidency of the Democrat Woodrow Wilson, they sent U.S. Marine to Haiti to occupy Haiti for 19 years. During that occupation, they changed the Haitian constitution. Before that, no foreigner, no uh, people, no foreigner could own land in Haiti. The U.S. changed the Haitian constitution. So foreigner could start uh, owning land in Haiti. After that, they took the uh, money, the reserve gold in the National Bank of Haiti. That money was transferred into the National City Bank. The money of Haiti actually helped to build Wall Street. So now it's very important in a program of global perspective to, have, to give that global perspective to our listener. Because now we are, uh, many people, we are start having that conversation about Oklahoma, the first black Wall Street. But we don't talk about, you know, the money of Haiti that participate in building Wall Street in the United States of America. And until now, Haitian people do, did not receive any kind of economic uh, reparation whatsoever for what the U.S. did to Haiti between 1915 and 1934. So it, just to give you, uh, if we move uh, uh, closer to us, it was in the context of the World War, World War and uh, the the Cold War uh, between the East and the West. So the U.S. for 29 years, both Democrat president and Republican president, they back up one of the most retrograde dictatorship in Haiti for 28 years, the dictatorship of the Duvalier, with first François Papa Doc Duvalier and then Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier. Under the administration uh, of Ronald Reagan, so the, uh, through the CBI, the Caribbean Basin Initiative, the U.S. will start a process of neoliberalization in Haiti to undermine local production in Haiti. So then, during the administration of um, uh, the Bush, Haiti elected in December 1990 his first president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide who was a former priest, uh, you know, with a viewpoint uh, connected to the uh, um, um, liberation theology. 
But because at that time, Jean-Bertrand Harris, it was against anti anti again, it was anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, and anti-neoliberalism, the U.S., through the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, they engineered a coup with the complicity of the hierarchy of the army of Haiti and the complicity of the private sector of business, what we would call an economic bourgeoisie, but in Haiti we don't have an economic bourgeoisie, they overthrew the Aristide. And Aristide came into exile, was sent into exile in Washington, and in order to restore Aristide into power, Aristide had to accept to sign the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is the framework for uh, implementing neoliberal policies in Haiti. And that happened under the administration of William Jefferson Bill Clinton. Then, in 2010, Haiti suffered an earthquake. And Barack Obama, who voiced to be the first uh, uh, black person to become president, Barack Obama said, Bill Clinton in Haiti to overview the reconstruction of Haiti. And Bill Clinton managed $13, 13 billion, and that money was missed. That money was never used to rebuild Haiti. So just to give you that general context to understand how foreign power have always played a negative role in shaping Haitian uh, politics and policies. Professor St. Paul, you mentioned the United States throughout the information that you gave us, which was very good background. If you had to summarize why the United States has been so involved, uh, why would that be? That's a very uh, uh, interesting question. Why there are many reasons for that. Uh, one of the first reasons is to perpetuate um, uh, white supremacy because uh, the international community until now, from 1804 until 2021, they never forgive and won't never forgive Haiti for showing the way to the oppress of the global South. Because the Haitian Revolution, Kati, was not something that was made just for the liberation of Black people. It was for the liberation of every person oppressed whatsoever. So, and uh, the system, the racialized capitalist system we are dealing with, cannot uh, move, cannot develop without racism. So, there is, that is something that is symbolically, they want to punish Haiti, continue to punish in Haiti in order to send a message to all black people all, all around the world. Oh, if you want to fight back, if you want to challenge us, look what is ha what happened to Haiti. Do you want to become Haiti? This is like a kind of symbolic lesson the international community want to send to every uh, person, black, brown, whatsoever, every oppressed who want to stand for justice, for racial justice. This is something that is important. There is also a geopolitical reason. Geopolitical reason, if you take the map of Haiti, Haiti is uh, occupied a very strategic position between Cuba and Venezuela, uh, close to Panama. So there is a very important geopolitical. If they control Haiti, controlling Haiti in terms of geopolitics means a lot for the for the international community and for the U.S. in his continuing struggle against Russia, etc. Haiti is located very close to Cuba. And remember, on January 1st, the first day of the Haitian Revolution, but in 1959, happened the uh, Cuban Revolution. So Haiti occupied a very strategic position. This is the second idea that uh, um, can explain the interest of the U.S. in Haiti. The third idea has to deal also with the resources of Haiti, because uh, it's important also in the media to use that perspective of the construction of some, you know, hegemonic narrative, because the hegemonic narrative has be always been Haiti is the poorest country of the Western Hemisphere. But this is a big lie, because if Haiti was the ca poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, how come the U.S. has the, the fourth most 
imported embassies of the U.S. is located in Haiti? Why is the interest of you to invest that a bunch of money to build an embassy in the poorest country? It's because Haiti is not poor. Haiti has a bunch of um, uh, resources, natural resources. According to many research, Haiti has more reserve, petroleum reserve more than Venezuela. Haiti has uranium. Haiti has natural gas. Haiti has gold. So it's the common strategy that imperialism has been using. When you discover a country has that much uh, um, uh, resources, this, the, the, the idea is to put a U.S. puppet, imperial puppet, in order that you can negotiate better or took those resources. Because if we, you, allow Haitian people to manage their own country, to have sovereignty, if you are uh, uh, allow, for instance, people with strong mindset, people with competency to, to be the leader of the country, so the, the condition will be different. And the imperial power do not want that. They just want to take resources from those places. So uh, the strategy has always been the same as they did in Africa, for instance, in Congo. Uh, so, for instance, is the destabilization to put chaos so that can be easier for them to take those resources, right? Though I think we have to combine those different factors in order to understand what is, what is the rationale of the international community under the leadership of the U.S. to treat Haitian to adopt such noxious foreign policy toward Haiti. P Professor St. Paul, and all of your points uh, are very uh, much appreciated. A question about if there is another side, another thought process in Haiti. Are there Haitians who say, help us because we know that there are countries currently who would like or at least it appears to us that they would like uh, u.s help or assistance or sometimes even intervention so talk to us about another mindset that does exist in haiti or or does it not exist tell us about that yeah this is a good question also because it would be unfair and unethical intellectually uh, from my part to just portray the problem of Haiti as foreign power. We also have to do a diagnostic of the uh, local elites. In Haiti, we don't have elite party. For instance, the economic elite, we don't have a strong economic elite, a national bourgeoisie that would, for instance, invest in the industrialization in creating jobs. No, in Haiti, what we have, we have a class that is called themselves private sector of business. You see business, negocios in Spanish. We say negocios. They see those economic actors, they see Haiti, they are mostly light-skinned because in Haiti we have mostly 99% of the population of black skin. But guess what? The economy of Haiti is not run in by those black skin. So it's run in by mulattoes, light-skinned, people, you know, of Lebanon descent, you know, people of Arabic descent. So those guys, they have another country. They have other countries. So despite the fact some of them might have been living in the country for 100 years, 150 years, but those family, they, if they hold a Haitian passport, it's just for convenience to do deal, to do negotiations, to do business in Haiti. But they have their American passport their German passport, their Belgian passport, their French passport. So Haiti is a country in which the economy is running by foreigners, although those foreigners claim to be Haitian, but they don't have any sense of belonging to the soul, to this uh, local space of Haiti. This is a diagnostic of the economic elite. We don't have economic elite. We have the diagnostic of the political elite. Those politi politicians, we have Kati in the country, uh, historically, people who see power, who see politics as a means to become wealthy, not people who see politics as a means to put 
those institutions at the service of the citizenry or the citizenship. This is very important to understand. Haiti has had historically a disconnection, a disconnection between those elite and the masses of the population. For instance, the masses of the population speak Haitian Creole. 100% of the population speak Haitian Creole. But guess what? The intellectual elite in Haiti, they refuse themselves in speaking a French. That is the language of the master, you know, the, 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 the former master. So they don't use the language that he, the masses. So there is a problem of communication between the elite and the masses. So let's talk about, for instance, the uh, 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 religious elite. The religious elite, you know, Haiti is not a Christian uh, uh, mostly a Christian country, but those religious elites, they say, oh, we embrace Christianity, but they undermine what we call in sociology the popular religion of Haiti. So we have to put all those pieces together in order to have a more broader, complete picture. For instance, if in Haiti we have had very uh, important elites with a strong vocation. By, for instance, vocation comes from German view of, that means self-commitment, self-sacrifice. We in Haiti, we don't have elite people who are willing to self-sacrifice themselves for the well-being of the population. However, recently we have in the diaspora and in Haiti some grassroots who want to find for Haiti to have against his sovereignty. Because at the moment that I'm giving this interview, Haiti is not a sovereign country, right? Haiti is, uh, the sovereignty of Haiti has been vassalized by the international community. For instance, now we have the prime minister that was sworn today, but this prime minister, Ariel Henry, was just put in power by the core group, not by Haitian people. So we have to understand there are certain actors, you know, grassroots from below that are fighting, but the master of the system are too powerful. The possibility to be, to be co-opted by the master of the system or to be killed also. In the diaspora also, we have some Haitian American or Haitian Canadian, Haitian Mexican, Haitian Brazilian, and so who would like to return to Haiti, to contribute to Haiti. But Haiti, there is a mafia, that mafia, economic mafia, they invest a lot of money in politicians, for instance, and they prevent to have, for instance, dual citizenship. So, for instance, if you are Haitian and you go to Mexico, in order to have a better integration in Mexican society, you took the Mexican nationality. According to the Haitian constitution, you are not Haitian anymore. It's because we have the private sector of business who have a strong fear against, you know, fair competition. This is a very complex issue that we have to understand, to understand what is going on in Haiti. One quick question, Professor, and that is, despite all the recent terminal turmoil with the assassination of the president, are you optimistic that we're going to see some positive developments in Haiti in terms of the economy? So um, uh, to be more optimistic requires, you know, to put many things on the table. Haiti won't have that uh, stability if, for instance, there is not any kind of uh, change uh, in the foreign policy of the U.S., Canada, and the international community. And, uh, and that change won't happen also without a strong international solidarity, international solidarity of many progressive nations, many progressive citizens to help Haitian people to push back, to fight. Because in the current moment we are talking, there is an international war against Haiti. There is an international war against Haiti because, as I said earlier, the mission of the international community is to make Haiti as a very chaotic situation, just to send the lesson, never follow the path of Haiti. But if Haitian people also, if the uh, traditional uh, class, member of the traditional class, can 
you know, follow, uh, uh, you know, uh, forget for a moment, you know, their ego and do a minimum uh, uh, consensus. Because, you know, uh, Jovenel Moïse was killed, was assassinated uh, since uh, July 7. So they were fighting for power. But no one now can propose something in order to occupy the presidency. And you see the international community observing that the local actor cannot have that agreement so the, inter the international community imposed their own solution. But always the solution imposed or coming from the international community what will work for the interests of the international community, but never for the, work, for the interests of Haitian people. So definitely we need a paradigmatical shift. We need a change in the political culture of the elite. But a political culture does not change from morning to tomorrow, it will require time. And definitely we will need more to educate people about Haiti, educate people on the global, uh, on the global uh, stage about Haiti, but also educating Haitian people in Haiti. The media, they need to do a better job. For instance, many of the media, they are sell out because they are in the pocket of the most repugnant economic elite in Haiti. We need a new class of intellectual in Haiti. We need a new class of intellectual elite. We need a new class of cultural elite. We need a new class of politician. It will take time, but it will take time. But Haitian first, we need to have a clear consciousness about the legacy of the independence. We need to know who we are. What was the sense of the sacrifice that our ancestors did in order to give us Haiti. And we cannot achieve that without education, without an education uh, focused on a, the emancipation of a city, building process of a, uh, what I would call eman uh, emancipated citizenship. Professor St. Paul, thank you so much for your comments. We wish the best for the people of Haiti and hope that they can choose their own destiny going forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week on another episode of Global Perspectives.